But a lot of people in America have this idea that our relationship began when Richard Nixon went to China. But the reality is that Americans have been thinking and interested in China and Asia since the founding of the, the Republic of the United States in the, in the 1780s. In fact, our first ship went to China in 1783, the year that we really were, became an independent country. I'm John Pomfret, author of The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, America and China, 1776 to the Present. For better or worse, I'm not trained as a historian. I'm a journalist, and my job is to tell stories about people. And people make history. And yes, there are bigger forces, economics, dem demographics, geography. Of course, that plays a huge role in determining in some ways history. But people are the ones who make it. And so this is a compendium of stories about the people who, on both sides of the Pacific, have created this common story between China and the United States. And it's story driven because it is history. And there's the word story in the middle of history for a reason. The relationship in many ways was, is sort of trapped, as I write in the book, in this, this Buddhist cycle of reincarnation where Americans sort of rediscover China every 20, 20 some odd years, go crazy about it, have these huge expectations for great changes, which are invariably dashed, and, and huge disenchantment will set. And right now we're in this kind of disenchantment trough with China. But similarly with the Chinese, they also have these, these views of the United States as being the key to China's modernity, its moder modernization, which then inevitably are, are crushed, and they go through their own period of disenchantment with America as well. And we've rotated on this um, uh, cycle for, for, for many, many decades now. Um, and in terms of our looking at our relationship with Asia, uh, we've been struggling about how to construct a situation in Asia where no one country dominates the region. In the 1920s and the 1930s, well, actually, I mean, from, from, from in the 19th century, we wanted to make sure that Britain didn't dominate Asia complete, completely. Uh, that soon switched to uh, a, a desire not to make, to, to ensure that Russia didn't dominate Asia completely, which then fell into a desire to stop Japan from dominating Asia completely. And so now we're in a situation where we do not want China to, and we then of course we dealt with the Soviet Union, we didn't want them to dominate Asia completely, but now we're in a situation where we don't want China to dominate Asia completely. And so we've gone through this pattern of, of attempting to stop a regional hegemon from arising in Asia, not to quell them, contain them, but to manage the situation so that the other countries of Asia are not completely dominated by the principal Asian power. And the struggles that we had that I detail in this book from the 19th century to today um, will inf should inform naturally the policy in the future because you can see which policies succeeded and which policies failed. Americans and other foreigners, it's not just the story of Yanks and Chinese, but, but Westerners were deeply involved in what happened in China, not simply as the bad guys, but also as sort of, if you will, the good guys, uh, and or as, as in some cases, you know, just the adventurers that pushed the course of Chinese history. And so an example would be modernization. Uh, American missionaries, because sometimes in the academy in America, missionaries get a bad rap because they're considered cultural imperialists. You know, you, you, you shove Jesus down the unwilling craw of the Chinese who were steeped in an older creed, and that was culturally imperialist. But at the same time, you, you cannot uh, ignore the fact that they brought Western medicine, Western law, Western science, Western education. Missionaries started the first literacy programs for women in China. They were the largest and most important factor in convincing the Qing court to finally ban foot binding, which one could argue is the biggest human rights uh, advance in, in modern Chinese history. And so at, at that point, missionaries were deeply involved. And that trend of China being a place where Americans could be, American women in particular, could be very successful has actually continued to this day. So. The first great American writer, female writer, who won a Nobel Prize for Literature, Pearl Buck, writing from China. Some of the greatest American journalists, women journalists, wrote Emily Han, an example for The New Yorker, wrote from China. And then you have the 1980s, of course, where, where the great American consultants and the deal makers were women. Virginia Kamsky and Kamsky Associates, and then she only hired, hired women. 
So this idea of China's role is playing not just Americans, it's not just Americans who've changed China, but it's also China that's changed the United States. And I think that was really important to me to, to write about this symb symbiotic nature of the relationships. So the idea has been very deep, both in our DNA, but also in the Chinese DNA, that China is the land of opportunity for Americans and vice versa for the Chinese. Uh, you had very early on, in 1783, there was a decision pushed by uh, financiers of the American Revolution, given the fact that, you know, here were 13 colonies on the east coast of the United States. The British had blocked all their ports to American commerce. And these financiers in Philadelphia come up that, hey, let's toss this Hail Mary football pass and go trade with China. And that was a way for us to break out of this Brit British embargo. And it did wonders. In fact, the first fortunes, the founding fortunes of, of, of capitalists in the United States were made on the China trade. So you have the Astors, the Lowe's, the uh, Delano's, the Greens, making huge money in China and then reinvesting that money into industry in the United States. And so you have this curious situation where money from China made in the China trade and reinvested in America turned America into the 19th century's version of the factory of the world. Where, 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 where have we seen that? Again, flash forward to the 1980s, and you see the same thing with American money being used by Chinese capitalists to turn China into the factory of the world. Again, it's this sort of circular nature of the, of the relationship. What I can say is that if you look at the course of US history with China, the points where we've had the better relationship with Asia and with China are the points where we've actually been strong internally. And the Chinese, despite the fact that they love us less than they did a few years ago, still look up to the United States very much so. And only when we're strong internally can we actually present a good front in China. And so how we progress as a society makes a difference in Asia. So we might not want to carp about human rights of the Chinese nonstop, but we need to ensure that we continue to progress as a society. Because if we don't maintain a role as a potential role model for China, that could also lead us into problems as well.